surprise, everybody. Yay! Yay. Yay. We're going to try it today and, and for two or three Sundays and see how it works out. And if I can keep my breath and, and uh, not mess up too bad, well, we'll continue to do it for a while. So I'm, yes, I'm happy that I can. I prayed about it for a while and uh, I gave it some self-consideration. Harry said, since you're replacing Scott, you surely can't mess up very well. <laughs> <laughs>
Trust in the Lord. And, you know, we, we think about prayer. We talk about prayer. Where we, we come to God basically saying, God, I trust you. I believe that when I, I ask you things, you will answer my prayer. Um, a little over a week ago, there was an incident that I read about in the news, and you maybe did too, but it, it happened in um, uh, Portland, Oregon, where a group of Christians had gathered uh, by the waterfront. I don't know if that's a river or a, a part of the ocean, but they had gathered there to have a worship service, and they had the sound system there, and they were singing praise songs, and I don't know what all the, they were but it was a Christian gathering. Well, a, a group of, of individuals, I don't know, they were some kind of Antifa types. They came in their black masks and their black garb, and they, they literally disrupted their service. They um, they taunted them. They, they took their food. They had picnic food. And took their food. They they got on. They Whenever the people basically over the sound system, the Christians said, well, we just come in the name of Jesus. We're, and and they, they got up there and started saying blasphemous things over the church sound system. They ended up throwing the sound system in the, 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 the water later. Um, they were spraying the individuals, even including, I guess, children and small ones with some kind of spray, like a bear spray, uh, literally ass assaulting them. Uh, but but it, it kind of struck me at, at one point it said that um, one of the, the the members of the mob had gotten up onto the sound system and a voice was heard yelling where is your God now <laughs> to these Christians they did all of this stuff to them and, and for the most part I, I think the Christians were pretty laid back in their you know, reaction to it. I mean, they didn't try to counterattack or hurt the people in any great way. And uh, and so they were yelling, where is your God now? As they tossed their equipment into the water and basically disrupted that worship service. And, and you know, sometimes I think we're tempted to, to ask that question, where is God now? Um, do we really believe that God is a prayer hearing and prayer answering God? Or sometimes maybe we, we have in essence become Christian humanists who believe that we humans can do anything if we take time to plan carefully and implement the plan. And that God no really no longer really has the power that he, he used to have. You know, and it, it's a question that, uh, that, you know, makes you think. What, what should the, the Christian response be to that? You know, I think that, you know, I don't think that we're, we're prohibited from defending our families. Yet, on the other hand, do, you know, there, there's a scripture that says the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. And there's a, there's a, a temptation to use the hand of, of our uh, strength to, to counter the attacks of what in essence is Satan. Uh, it's, it's a perplexing question, but yet the Bible teaches us that we have a God who hears our prayers. Are we praying to God really, or are we just simply listing the things that we want and then figuring, well, I'm going to have to do something about this on my own? There's a, there was a, a Woody Allen uh, play, Love and Death, and in the, the play Napoleon, walked by his lady's room, his wife's room, and, and heard voices. And he asks her, and she says, I was praying. And Napoleon says, but I heard two voices. And she replies, well, I do both parts. <laughs> I ask God, and then I answer for him. And is that the way we do? Do we do both, both parts? We talk to God, and then we tell him what his answer ought to be. And then if he doesn't do what we ask them, ask them, we just maybe stop praying. How many times have you heard of somebody that said, well, I, I prayed to God and I prayed and I prayed and prayed. He, he didn't answer my prayer. My loved one died or things didn't go my way or things were, people were mean to me. And so I'm just giving up on it. How many times have you heard that? Maybe felt like that. But you know, we don't pray because we believe in prayer. We pray because we believe in God. And if we do believe that He is the all-powerful God of the Bible, 
He's not put his power on hold. And if we believe that he's not put his power on hold, that he still is sovereign, the creator of the universe, all powerful, then we will pray. You see, the power of prayer is the power of God. Psalm 115 verse 3 declares our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. See, God does what he pleases according to his will. He doesn't need our vote, nor does he wait for our veto. He, he is the one that is in charge. He obviously knows what's going on far better than we do. Sometimes I think, you know, how in the world could I begin to understand the mind of God? I don't even know how half the stuff that I use every day works. I don't know how my phone really works. I mean, if you, if you uh, said, you know, Tim, why don't you build an iPhone all by yourself? Is there any way I could do something like that? No, I could maybe fashion a crystal radio out of some parts and maybe get a station to come in over a wire. And I'm not even sure I totally understand how that works. But there's just, I mean, and then to think I could, I could second guess, I could understand the mind of God completely. No, it's only because God has revealed himself to me. And it's only because I can see the complexity of the universe and that it just demands that there was a creator. And when I see how intelligent that God must be, and yet he tells me he loves me and he wants me to talk to him and bring my requests and petitions to him, then it's an amazing thing. Even King Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament, who was not known as some really wonderful person, he knew that the God of Israel had the kind of power that I'm talking about. That king declared in Daniel chapter 4, verse 35, he, God, does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? So if we're going to talk about prayer, and I want to talk about prayer this morning, the first thing we need to do is realize the, the awesomeness of God. You know, some have been taught that the only reason we pray is to change ourselves. And I suppose there's a sense in which that's true. But the Bible does not just teach that we, uh, we pray to God so that we will be changed. You know, come and you know, align ourselves with God's purposes. Well, maybe that's part of it. But instead, really, the Bible teaches that prayer affects God. And that prayer can affect circumstances. And that's the first thing that we talk about this morning. Uh, that, that prayer affects God. It influences Him. Aren't you influenced when your kids talk to you? Of course you are. Well, so is God. He is the perfect parent as well as the almighty creator. And the Bible teaches that God is affected when His people pray. For instance, you remember when God brought his people out of Egypt through those great miracles that, that, that he worked through Moses? And after coming through the sea, they stopped at Mount Sinai for a time. For a time. And, and while Moses was having this long talk with God up on the mountain, then all the people were melting down their jewelry. They got impatient. They thought, well, God's just abandoned us. You know, and so they melted down their jewelry and they fashioned it into a, a golden calf which was one of the deities, I think, of, of Egypt. And, and guess what? They started worshiping that calf. Can you imagine? They, they sang hymns to the calf. They brought offerings, declared that the calf was the God that had brought them out of Egypt. To say the least, God was not pleased. And he said to Moses, and this is in Exodus chapter 32, verses 9 and 10. God says, I have seen these people and they are a stiff-necked people. And then God gives Moses a command. He says to, to Moses, now leave me alone. Ever said something like that? that when you're aggravated, leave me alone. Well, God says, leave me uh, uh, alone. And he continues, he says, so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then, I will make you into a great nation. You know, I think if that's what he said to the children of Israel, I wonder what he thinks about us. <laughs> I wonder if the wrath of God is being stored up by the whole things that, that we do. 
Well, even though God told Moses to leave him alone, Moses immediately began to beg God not to destroy his people. And in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 18, it tells us that he kept begging for 40 days and 40 nights. You, you know what happened? Well, then in Exodus chapter 32, verse 14, it says, The Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Isn't it amazing that our prayers can make a difference with God? God listened carefully and he changed his mind. Well, then there's King Hezekiah in the Old Testament. This is in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. God told Hezekiah through the prophet Isaiah to get his house in order because he was going to die. But Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, and before Isaiah got out of the palace courtyard, God told him to go back and tell the king. And he said, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you, and I will add 15 years to your life. I preached a sermon on this one time years ago, and, and basically he gave him 15 years because he had a job for King Hezekiah to do. And so sometimes we pray to God to give us more time on earth. Well, was that so we can play more golf? You know, so, so we can uh, we can go kayaking, you know, or, or so we can eat out in restaurants a few more times before we die. No, usually God has a purpose for us here on life, and He gives us more time here on earth than it's it's for a purpose, and that's the way it was with Hezekiah. But He did hear his prayer, and He gave him fifteen more years. Uh, some people suggest that God never changes his mind, but listen to what God says about himself. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 and 8, God says, If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned it repents of its evil, then I will relent and will and, and not inflict, inflict on it the disaster I had planned. Now, we, we need to understand that God will never change his mission, his goal, or his plan for the, rede the redemption of humanity. He will and can change some particulars and methods in response to the prayers of his people. And that part of, of what it, that's part of what it means to be God, that he has the right and he has demonstrated that many times he can and will change his mind. It'd be amazing to know how many times God relented and gave us another chance when we really didn't deserve it, or our people, or our nation, or various places in the world. So, uh, we need to understand that, that prayer affects God. Now, second of all, prayer can affect circumstances. Not only can prayer affect God, prayer can also affect circumstances because we're talking to the one that has all power. Yesterday, today, forever. One of the messages of the Bible is the, the omnipotence or the all-powerfulness of God. In Genesis 18, 14, chapter 18, verse 14, we read, Is anything too hard for the Lord? And when God was going to fill a, a valley full of, of water without any rain or wind, He said, This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. That's in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 18. An angel who came directly from heaven to Mary brought this message. Nothing is impossible with God in Luke 1 37. Jesus, who knows God better than anyone, said with God all things are possible in Matthew 19 26. So if God, an angel, an inspired prophet, and Jesus himself proclaimed the awesome power of God, then we who are Christians ought to proclaim that as well and believe it. The disciples once asked each other about Jesus. Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. In Luke 8, 30, or 25. When Jesus commanded that the fig tree dry up, it didn't have a committee meeting with the other fig trees to see what to do. Anytime God speaks to nature, nature has no option but to obey. Now, we human beings are the only part of creation that God has given the freedom to listen to a command and then decide whether or not we're going to obey or not. Nothing else in the world has that option. That's the reason God could say to the Red Sea, open up, and the Red Sea opens up. 
Remember the battle that Joshua was involved in back in the Old Testament? Daylight was running out before the battle was over, so Joshua prayed for more daylight. And the Bible said God caused the sun to stand still. And what a day that was. Now some people say that shows the Bible doesn't know anything about science. Because it's not the sun that moves, but the earth. I suspect God knew that. I suspect that God said something like this. Earth, stop right now in your tracks. Everything else that is dependent on the earth's rotation, just hang loose. I'm in charge here. So don't let the, the phrase, the sun stood still, bother your confidence in God's word. I guarantee you the next time that you watch the weather or television or look at your little app about the weather on your phone, you'll see something like sunrise at 645, sunset 710. You see, I've never heard anyone say, you know, I'm not going to watch TV anymore. I'm not going to look at my iPhone anymore or that weather app uh, because they should have said, tomorrow morning the earth is going to rotate so that the edge of the circumference of the sun will appear on the horizon at 6.45 a.m. Who wants to hear all of that when you can just say sunrise and sunset? Remember when Daniel was thrown to the lions, the lions were starving. But when Daniel came on the scene, God must have said, you know, right now lions, you're not hungry. Uh, you, you don't want to eat uh, Daniel. Uh, they lost their appetite. Remember when John was thrown overboard, overboard? Overboard. The Bible says that God provided a great fish to swallow him. God must have said something like, you know, in, in the way that only God can talk to his creation. Now, fish, the next thing you see splash into the water, I want you to swallow it whole. I don't want you to hurt it. Fish had no option but to obey. John was in the fish for three days and nights. I'm convinced that, that John did everything he could to get out of that fish. He was tickling his ribs. He was kicking his ribs. He was, uh, you know, pretty miserable, I'm sure. God made it so the fish's digestive juices didn't hurt uh, Jonah. And then finally, Jonah uh, realized his crisis and he began to pray. Same thing that we do. Don't wait till we, we wait until things get really, really bad before we start praying. And then Jonah's finished, as, as he's finished praying, the Lord ordered the fish to spit Joe, Jonah up onto the beach, and it did. God must have said something like, now fish, I want you to surface, find the beach, spit that man right out of your mouth. Must have been a fantastic spit. <laughs> you see, prayer does have power to affect circumstances. What about today? Scott, Hear our prayers today. Does he continue to hear our prayers and intervene in our lives today? I know that he does. In fact, I don't know why I don't do this. I should write down my prayers and then write down when God answers them. They happen all the time. This, one little thing happened to me. This is not important really in the, the grand scheme of things, but it was kind of important to me. I decided that I needed to because gas prices were going higher and, and I've been driving my pickup truck with that you know, 350 Vortec engine and it all around, it does not get good gas mileage. And, and I thought, you know, I need to find me a little car that gets better gas mileage. Because I figured out the amount of money I could save in gas in a month would just about more than make that payment. Because I'm not talking about buying a brand new car, I'm just going to get a used car. So I started praying about that, started looking, and I found this little car. And I was able, I found a way to, to get some money. Right, in essence, borrow from myself and so back. But um, I came up with the amount to buy the car, and I bought it over in Missouri, in St. Louis. The only problem, I, and the good thing too, is I had just enough to buy the car, and I didn't have to pay, pay property tax or you know tax and title and all that stuff until I got to Illinois, and I had a few weeks to do that. But then I'm thinking, okay, now I got to come up with almost a thousand dollars to pay for the tax. And I didn't really have it right then, so I started praying about that. God, please make me, uh, help me pay this tax and stuff, and title and license. Out of the blue, that next week, my boss gave us all each a check for $1,000. Never does that. Maybe at Christmas time, and not that much. And just out of the blue, he was just appreciative of all the work we've been doing, because we've been working shorthanded. Out of the blue, he writes me a check for $1,000. I've got enough now to more than pay what I owe to take care of that car. 
Now, that's an answer to prayer. <laughs> that's kind of the way to look at it. It's not a big thing. It's not, you know, it's not like the end of the world. But it, it was a thing that I prayed for specifically. And God gave it to me. Um, my cousin Ron Morse, the missionary, a whole family of missionaries in Thailand. I remember him telling the story about he was years ago working with some villagers in northern Thailand. And, and that area was having the worst grasshopper play that anyone can remember. They're very agrarian, you know, you know culture. They plant and grow. That's how they live. And finally, the leader of the village said to Ron, you know, and they weren't Christians. He said, you go away and gather your Christians and pray for three weeks that the grasshoppers will leave the Christians fields and not and but not the non-Christian fields. You know, a little test. And if when you return in three weeks, the grasshoppers have left the Christians fields and are still in the non-Christian field, I will help you lead this whole village to worship your Jesus. Now that's a challenge because he's not just saying get rid of all the grasshoppers. He's saying you take the grasshoppers away from the Christians who are there, their fields, but leave the grasshoppers on the non-Christians fields. Then we'll know that your God hears prayers and answers in the name of Jesus. And so with earnestness and sincerity, the Christians prayed. Three weeks later, Ron came into the village and was devastated by what he saw. It was obvious that the grasshoppers were still in the Christians fields. In fact, there were more grasshoppers in those fields. But upon careful examination, they found that the grasshoppers in the Christians' fields were only eating the weeds. They weren't touching the rice, while the grasshoppers in the non-Christians' fields were eating the rice and not the weeds. There were so many grasshoppers in the Christians' field that, during, uh, that the, the, the droppings that they left fertilized the ground and so that there was an abundance of rice to feed all the people. <laughs> and so sometimes God, we ask him for something and he goes one better. He says, okay, you, you know, you think grasshoppers are your problem. No, here's the problem. The grasshoppers are eating your crops. What if I have them eat the weeds and then the droppings they leave will actually fertilize your crops and make them better. It was only happening in the Christians' fields. In the non-Christians' fields, grasshoppers were eating the rice. See, he made uh, he answered their prayer, but not exactly as they prayed it. Missionary Jim McElroy tells about something that happened in the Philippines when he was called into a village. An infant was deathly ill. The child had not nursed for days and was turning gray. His eyes were rolled back. He was lifeless and listless, apparently just moments from death. Jim turned to the Filipino preacher and said, I didn't know we were coming here for a medical reason. I brought no medicine, did you? And the Filipino preacher said, no, what shall we do? And Jim said, well, let's just pray. And while they were praying fervently for God's intervention, the little infant reached up and touched one of those who was praying. And before they finished, the infant moved toward his mother's breast and began to nurse. The following Sunday was Easter. As Jim was preaching in a neighboring village in an outdoor assembly, he saw... Uh, coming over the brink of a hill, a woman carrying a baby. Behind her were over 20 adults. As they got cl closer, Jim recognized the mother in her infant, who by now was looking very healthy. The adults had come to accept Jesus Christ and they emerged because they saw prayer answered in a specific and, in a wonderful way. See, we, we serve a powerful and awesome God. And sometimes... <laughs> People say, you know what? We just threw your sound equipment in the ocean. Where's your God now? And sometimes they, they kill people and say, where's your God now? Do you know what? At the end of the day, faith in God always has the, the last word. Because <laughs> this, this life is temporary. This life is moving in a direction where God's going to settle accounts. It's, it's going to happen. It's coming. You can bank on that. And we don't know about tomorrow. We don't know about next week. We don't know if we'll get COVID. We might get COVID, not get that sick. We might get COVID and die. There are people who get it and in the same family, some get deathly ill, others don't. You can get masks. You can have masks. You can have uh, vaccinations and still get it. I mean, there are no guarantees in this life. And you know what? I'm pretty sure cancer didn't go away. 
I'm pretty sure that all of these other diseases that used to be around didn't go away either. The, the fact of the matter is there's a 100% chance that something in this life is going to kill you. I used to laugh and say, you know, 100% of people that ate carrots in their life died. <laughs> Eating carrots must be bad. 100% of people who ate them died eventually. But you know what? At the end of the day, we who have put our faith in Jesus Christ will not be disappointed. When we stand on the, the brink of eternity or sit or probably lay on the edge of eternity, ready to go off into that great abyss that nobody really knows anything about personally. Oh, yeah, we've got all these near-death experiences. But you know what? Uh, there's a point where you're, you're, you're dead and you don't come back. Okay, well, what then? Well, let me tell you, Jesus has already been there. He came back. And now he's alive. And he said, if we put our faith in him, then he's going to give us a resurrection body like his. And we'll live in eternity with him in a perfect place. Not some high in the sky utopia that political persuasions try to promise to people in this life. But a real heaven, a real new heaven, new earth that he's creating now. We're going to, we're going to close this morning and offer an invitation song, a time, an opportunity if you've never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior uh, to accept Him in faith, put your faith in Him confess His name, repent of your sin be baptized into Him uh, put your faith, your confidence in Him make Him the Lord of your life, the boss of your life and you won't be you won't be dis, uh, disappointed if you keep your faith in Him if you walk with Him no matter what no matter what happens and He's promised to be with us till the end of the age 513. Oh, how he loves you. Would you stand with me? If you have a decision to make, come down. Oh, how he loves you.